It was closed. And because there was no left turn available to them, they turned right and pressed on to preach and encourage in other regions. Then they came to another fork in the road with another set of awesome possibilities up into the region of Bithynia. At the northwest of Bithynia is Byzantium, the city that would become the Rome of the East, Constantinople, and today Istanbul. And we have no idea if their plan, that plan is playing in their minds, of course, but Byzantium would have been a natural focus. The western end of the Silk Road and the eastern end of the Roman Road, via Ignatia leading, of course, to Rome. Strategically, brilliant. In one preaching tour, they would evangelize traders coming west from China, India, and Persia, and traders coming from Europe and Rome itself. What a crossroads in a place to establish the church. But again, actively pressing on into Bithynia, they come up against the wall of the Spirit's will. So they can't go right into Bithynia, and they can't go left to the seven cities of Asia Minor. So they must go straight on to Troas. Luke, the author of Acts, likely joins them in Troas. So he's on hand one morning when Paul wakes up excited about his overnight vision of a man from Greece begging him to come over and preach the gospel there. And right there and then, they drop everything and press on down to the wharf and get on a boat. An island hopping 200 kilometers across the North, e uh, the North Aegean Sea, rather, they set foot on the European continent and join the Via Ignatia, climbing the hills out of the port city of Neapolis and walk 10 kilometers across the plateau to the wealthy Roman administrative city of Philippi. Let's, oops, sorry. There's a kilter here. There we go. The wealthy Roman administrative city of Philippi. Now normally when Paul gets to a new city, he finds the local synagogue and shares the good news there first. But Philippi doesn't have enough followers uh, up to the Jewish face for, for, for a synagogue. So as the holy, week of, as holy day of the week dawns, Paul and the others head down uh, to the river uh, where there is a place of prayer. And there Lydia, a prominent businesswoman of the city, accepts Jesus as her savior and is baptized with all her household and opens her family home for Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke to stay. So it seems things are going exceptionally well in Philippi and people are believing. Paul, Silas, Timothy and Luke are regularly going to a place of prayer by the river. But as they go, they're constantly being heckled by a slave girl who is physically owned by others and spiritually owned by a de demonic spirit through which she tells fortunes and makes her physical owners rich. And troubled by this demonic battle, Paul commands the spirit to leave in Jesus' name, who is above, of course, all principalities and powers. And with their income ex exercised, rather, the angry owners drag, excuse me, Paul and Silas to the town leaders and accuse them of breaking Roman law. The crowd gets involved, bays for blood, and, and unjustly without trial, Paul and Silas are publicly stripped and severely whipped. And I don't know if that rings a bell in your mind going back to Jesus' time. Thrown into jail, they are treated like radical revolutionaries or vile criminals and put into the maximum security part of the jail with feet chained into great wooden stocks. And as the night wears on in those austere circumstances, while Paul and Silas rather are ministering in the dark to other prisoners through prayer and singing, there is a massive earthquake. The earthquake literally springs everything loose. My chains are gone, I've been set free, we sing as part of the, the modified words of amazing grace. Lives are changed by the power of God's witness through Paul and Silas. The other prisoners are transformed and don't escape. And the jailer's life is spared as though through fire. And together with family, he believes, and they're all baptized. Wow. 
Now morning comes and the city leaders alerted to a looming public relations crisis from the unjust treatment of Roman citizens send undersecretaries to ask Paul and Silas to quietly leave the city. But Paul, of course, has the right personality for a proactive role. Won't hear of leaving without being personally escorted out of prisoner, prison rather, by the leaders themselves with naturally countless and obsequious apologies. And perhaps Paul in his wisdom sees here an opportunity to protect this new and fledgling church in Philippi from overzealous government. And so from prison, Paul and Silas go back to Lydia's house, encourage the new Christians, gather Timothy and what little they have, and carry on to leave Philippi. And so this snippet of story finishes with the morning sun in the sky and Paul, Silas and Timothy, but maybe not Luke, pressing on purposefully again along the Via Ignatia, a hundred or so kilometers west toward Thessalonica, having already traveled at least a thousand kilometers by foot over the duration of chapter 16 of Acts. And you know, 20 year old Timothy, perhaps by nature a little shy and possibly not physically strong, is probably supporting Paul and Silas because they've been badly beaten less than 24 hours ago. They haven't slept all night. And this, this is a small band of Christians on whom God's plans rest for evangelizing the Greek peninsula and places west and establishing churches and places like Corinth and so forth that we have come to know well. And I wonder if Paul has in mind this day when five years later he writes to the Christians in Corinth, but we have this treasure in chars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power from God is from God rather and not from us. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Do you want to press on in faith and be a participating Christian with a spiritual backbone and not just an observing one? I do. And this doesn't happen by chance and it won't happen tomorrow. Days and years are disappearing fast and here we are standing on the brink of halfway through 2021. Today is when we need to choose to be pressing on Christians. And there are three important principles woven into this story from Acts that will help us do this deliberately. The first principle is to be pressing on in partnership. Acts 16 gives us at least three partnership examples that are vital for Christians wanting to press on. Partnership with the Holy Spirit, with the church family, and in relationships that run deep. In Acts chapter 16, verse 4, Paul, Luke rather writes that Paul, Silas, and Timothy delivered to the churches in Galatia a letter written by church leaders in Jerusalem. And the words of that letter are in Acts chapter 15, and one line in particular stands out. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And so Paul and the others encouraged motivated and grew believers throughout the province of Galatia in part as they heard and understood this partnership with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> now glance around if you will. Aren't we an interesting and very group of people? You know there are generally few places that you will find a cross-section of community that come together in the same way as they do in a growing and alive church family. Do we celebrate that enough? Are we encouraging each other to press on in our faith? How well do we do this and how well do we work together? A decade after Lydia's conversion in Philippi, the night in the jail and the start of the local church family there, Paul would write a letter to the Philippians saying, I thank my God Every time I remember you, in all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you 
will carry it on and to, com uh, to carry it on to completion rather until the day of Christ Jesus. And this partnership is part of God's work in us. It is a team effort. In the Bible book of Hebrews, it says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward doing a toward love, sorry, and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day of eternity, if you like, approaching. Now, as well as this whole church family here on a Sunday morning, do you know about and have you thought about joining some of the other ministry and home groups here at Lincoln Road Bible Chapel if you aren't already participating? Tonight, as we've said, we have a special prayer meeting here in the church building. And then there are other small groups that you can join uh, throughout the week. And I know that Catherine and Jake, who's not here this morning, but they would be just so pleased to be able to give you some contact details. Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke were a very and interesting small group. They encouraged the local church families they visited and in turn were encouraged by their faith. They helped establish, feed, and grow a new church in Philippi. And do you see the pressing on Christian Christ-centered <coughs> pattern rather in that particular small group? And then we have partnership in deep personal relationship. Listen to Acts chapter 16 and verse 3. Paul wanted to take Timothy along on the journey. So he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Twenty-year-old Timothy, and I keep on emphasizing that because I think that really hits a number of you, 20-year-old Timothy comes with great references, and Paul sees in him a companion that he can mentor for life. But for reasons that we won't dive into just at the moment, this was a deep partnership that began intimately, with lifelong consequences for Timothy and real physical risk for him. Sixteen or so years later, in the final stages of Paul's life, you can sense the closeness of their father and son bond, almost father and son bond, and the loneliness of Paul's words when he writes, do your best to Timothy, this is, do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved the world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Cretans has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. You know, eventually we need these sorts of accountability relationships in our Christian faith if we are to keep pressing on with purpose. The second principle that we find in Acts chapter 16, illustrated in Acts chapter 16, is pressing on with plans, but being prepared to change course. There are 9,356 book titles at the online Christian bookshop Quran.com that have God's will in the title or keywords. Do you think this might be a topic of interest to Christians? In contrast, there are 1,749 books with money and 2,882 books with relationships in the titles or keywords. Kevin DeYoung, the author of a book we actually have in our bookshop at home called Just Do Something, writes, too often God's people tinker around with churches, jobs, and relationships, worrying that they haven't found God's perfect will in their lives. Or even worse, they do absolutely nothing. Stuck in a frustrated state of paralyzed indecision, waiting, waiting, waiting for clear, direct, <coughs> unmistakable direction. Acts chapter 16 illustrates that we are free to creatively plan and act, but we recognize that God is creator and ultimately in control. So he knows his plans for us, operating outside of our limited um, view of our four-dimensional space. So it is critical that we prioritize knowing God through relationship and time spent with him. We 
have a strong sense that Paul and his companions wisely plan to visit key places, but surrender these actions to God through the Holy Spirit who directed them. And Paul wrote to the Church of Rome that he planned to visit them on his way to Spain in Romans chapter 15 and 24. And you know, we don't know for sure if these plans were also altered by the Holy Spirit or if Paul ever did get to Spain. But what we do know is that in his planning, he was pressing on. Our approach to pressing on with plans should be carried out as James, the brother of Jesus, suggests. Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we'll go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on in business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. There is a mystery in the thought that while we are free to plan and act, at the same time, God knows his plans for us. At a time when they were so, so far from home and needing insight, the prophet Jeremiah writes to God's exiled people in Babylon, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give a hope and a future. And we can be confident that nothing is happening haphazardly or by chance in our life. This was revealed to Paul in the vision he had during that night in Troas. The way west into Asia Minor and the way north into Bithynia were closed because of the Holy Spirit. Wanted Paul, Silas, Timothy and Luke to cross into Europe and share the good news about Jesus there for the first time. What seems like a great idea or a no-brainer to us often is a no-brainer because no human brain can see the full picture. And Paul understood that the slave girl was following him and the others and she was being controlled by demonic forces and he knew that this spiritual attack had to be countered. Let's not fall into the trap that thinking that this is all there is. There is a world outside of these four dimensions of space and time that is at war. In the Bible book of Daniel chapter 10, he writes about fasting and praying for a specific problem. And finally, after three weeks of silence and the hunger and everything else that went with that, an angel appears with God's response to Daniel's prayers. And the angel says that he has spent time battling his way through demonic powers for three weeks. And it wasn't until the senior of the angel Michael came to assist that he could finally break through to Daniel. And let's be equipped to accept that there may be reasons why the Holy Spirit opens or closes particular doors. We just cannot see the entire picture. It would have made so much four-dimensional sense for Paul, Silas, and Timothy to go into Asia Minor and visit those key cities. It would have made so much four-dimensional sense for them to go north into Bithynia toward the Silk Road trade and the gateway to Europe at Byzantium. But God, through His Holy Spirit, sees a different picture. In his letter to the church of Philippi, a decade after the Acts 16 visit, Paul says, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled, filled with the few fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. The most important thing that we can ever do is ensure our plans are God-centered, or to ensure our plans are God-centered, is to relate and therefore get to go know God better. When Jesus was asked what was the greatest commandment, he said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and all your soul, with all your soul, and mind, and with all your strength. This covers the physical and the spiritual. Can you claim to reach this standard? As we strive toward it and 
and the commitment it demands, the pathway of God's will will be obvious. We know what makes the people we love tick because of the relationship we have with them. It's not enough to say, well, I know what ticks you off. We likely already know that. And uh, we know, for example, what goes against God's will for us. But in a real relationship, we want to be able to say, I know what to do that exalts them, that lifts them up, that gives them pleasure. When we have that relationship with God, the pathways become clearer. Paul and his companions are at that level. The third principle is to keep pressing on through peaks, precipices, and pits. Our brain can be very good at playing tricks on us. Often we call this a confirmation bias. Sometime around uh, late May, early June of 1984, while at the top of the tower of the Americas in San Antonio, Texas, I developed an irrational concern for being up high things, often called the fear of heights. For 13 years, this was a pain in the neck. And then in late May 1997, it went just as fast as it came. On a hiking trip through the Grand Canyon in Arizona, I suddenly found I could comfortably sit on the edge of cliffs without concern. And Jeremy, I don't know if your mind is going to a day in about 1998 when we ran up that Ahoy. That was after this, so I was fine then. <laughs> it, was a, it was a tough day. <laughs> so what changed? Well, I can tell you it isn't just Red Bull that gives you wings. What had changed over the preceding two weeks was that I had fallen in love with an amazing woman. <laughs> and my oxytocin levels, the love hormone, were surging. I was walking on air, and what these hormones do to your brain is, of course, being a plastic brain, they tend to rewire it. My brain was suddenly rewired, and you may laugh, but this is actually, this is actually probably what happened. <laughs> you know, in a, in a similar way, our Christian life can unexpectedly pivot directions, and how we feel, or what our mind tells us, is not always the most reliable thing. Let's not be surprised, but let's be equipped. Nobody says it better than the wise teacher who was maybe Solomon, we're not 100% sure, but in the book of Ecclesiastes, when times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider this, God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, no one can discover anything about their future. When we're at the beach hoping to catch some waves, we know that they will tend to come in a sequence, but not always. The system is just a little bit too complicated for the past waves to fully predict the future waves. And in the same way, the wise teacher encourages us to accept the moment and avoid using it to try and predict the future. Paul's inner acceptances of the challenges that he, Silas, Timothy, and Luke faced in Acts 16 is referred to in his later letter to the church in Philippi. Whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how long, how I long rather for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And he would also say to the church in the relatively close city of Thessalonica, soon after his first visit there to Philippi, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Jesus. Growth creates stress, and well-applied stress helps growth. And that is why we work out and lift weights. We stress our muscle or cardiovascular system, either in order to grow them or, as we get older, just to try and keep as much of the muscle tone as we possibly can for as long as possible. And Paul's advice to Timothy is that physical training is of some value, but godliness has a value for all things holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. And as he pressed on through the peaks, precipices, and pitfalls of Acts 16, Paul's already well-developed spiritual muscles would have strengthened. But I suspect it was Timothy who really buffed up along the way with all the spiritual training as the team pushed on through challenges and Timothy, Timothy saw the physical costs carried by Paul and by Silas. 
Peter, one of Jesus' disciples and someone with whom Paul had challenging conversations, wrote, In all of this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, while you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Do we relish chances to have our faith tested and proven worthy of giving worship to Jesus? In 1945, a Roman Lutheran minister and his wife, Richard and Sabina Wormbrand, were invited, in inverted commas, by the new communist government to attend a congress of cults where religious leaders were expected to publicly support the country's new atheistic aims. When Richard had the opportunity to speak, Sabina turned to him and told him to wipe the shame from the face of Jesus. And Richard said in that case, she was likely to lose her husband. And she replied, I don't need a coward for a husband. So he pressed on and declared the supremacy of Jesus in front of 4,000 delegates. And between the years of 1945 and 1947, Richard distributed one million copies of the Gospels to, to Russian troops in Romania. In 1948, while walking to church, Richard Wernbrandt was arrested by Romanian secret police and would spend the next 14 years in jail tortured and in solitary confinement. And a little later, Sabina, his wife, would spend three years in labor camps. And night after night, Richard survived by reciting Bible verses he had memorized. His captors took everything else, but they couldn't take God's promises from him. And years later, Richard and Sabina were ransomed out or redeemed, if you like, from behind the iron curtain and began the voice of the martyrs ministry to the persecuted church. In the Bible book of John, Deuteronomy, Joshua spoke to the nation of Israel as they prepared to cross the Jordan and move into the land that God had promised them. And he encouraged them to adopt a wraparound all of life process for learning and remembering God regardless of the circumstances. These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And this wraparound all of life commitment to knowing God's words was how Paul and Silas not only survived their night in jail, but with a conduit through whom God changed the life of the jailer and his family and probably the other prisoners as well. And I wonder if as midnight approached, Paul and Silas were singing, I will hasten and not delay to obey your commands. Though the wicked bind me with ropes, I will not forget your law. At midnight, I rise to give you thanks for your righteous laws. God's ways remain just and right regardless of the injustice of our present circumstances. So how do we conclude this short dive into Acts chapter 16? We have three principles to help us press on in Christian faith. Press on in partnership. Press on with plans, but be prepared to change. And press on through obstacles. And we have witnesses like Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke who God wants us to know about and to illustrate these principles. And now they take a step back and as it were turn to look at us. Do you see what this means? All of these pioneers who blazed the way, all of these veterans cheering us on. It means we'd better get on with it. Strip down, start running and never quit. No extra spiritual fat. No parasitic sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it. Because 
he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way. Cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there. In the place of honor. Right alongside God. And when you find yourself flagging in your faith, go over that story again. Item by item. That long story of hostility he pressed on through. That will shoot adrenaline into your souls. May God bless the public reading of his word. Amen. Amen. Press on in faith, dear friends. Press on.